you got to be willing to walk alone sometimes because yeah. everyone doesn't fit on your journey at every part of your journey. You're not only worthy of success and abundance, you're worthy of self-care. You got to be willing to not stand in your story, but stand on your story. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Top 10, I got a top 10. Top 10. Got my motivation high for my top 10. Top 10. I learn from the wise women and men and men all my life. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more. And you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today, let's learn from one of the best, Lisa Nichols, and my take on her top 10 rules for success. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one. Be as free as a child. My nephew was sitting on my great uncle Leonard's lap. And my great uncle Leonard, he smoked cigars for like every year of my life. And I, at the time, was like 19. And I never saw him without a cigar. So Uncle Leonard smelled like a what? A really old cigar. And everyone knew Uncle Leonard smelled like a cigar. But no one had the courage to tell Uncle Leonard that he smelled like a cigar. You guys, everybody has had an Uncle Leonard somewhere in your life, right? Because Uncle Leonard was my grandmother's brother, so he had clout. Well, Jamil was three, so he didn't know. He, he, he hasn't been introduced to being politically correct yet. Thank God. Right? So, uh, Jamil is sitting on my Uncle Leonard's lap, and we're all talking. And Jamil stops in the middle of a sentence, and he goes... And the first time he sniffed, we, no big deal. But the second and the third time, <laughs> then in his little three-year-old voice, Uncle Yannard, you tink. <laughs> and you can hear a pin drop in the room. Oh. And everyone in that moment was grateful that they were not Jamil's mother. And we all gazed at her, bad mom, bad mom. <laughs> the next thing that fell out of Uncle Leonard's mouth shocked us all. He looked at Jamil with a long gaze, kind of not knowing what's about to happen gaze. And he said, Jamil, I think you're right. I think I tink. <laughs> For the first time in my entire life, Uncle Leonard put out his cigar, and the next time we saw Uncle Leonard, it smelled like he had just been washed for days. <laughs> he was always clean, but his clothes just smelled like old cigars, and it was very clear that he got new clothes. See the freedom that a child has, the truth that they stand with. Think like a child. Don't act like a child, but think like a child. Be as free as a child. See, children have a sense of curiosity. Children forgive sooner, quicker, faster. And if you want something new to come out of your voice, you have to put something new in you in terms of a commitment. My son, like I, I would watch the way he would forgive me. And he did something wrong one day and I had to reprimand him and I immediately felt guilty. And I'm in my office, he's like four years old and I'm on my, on my computer and I'm crying because I'm single mother guilt, entrepreneur. And I'm like, and he comes around the corner, he goes, mommy, and I just reprimanded him. He's on a timeout and all this stuff. And I'm upset. I'm crying. He's okay. <laughs> and he comes around the corner and I'm, and he says, mommy, mommy. I was like, yes. Do you want to lay down with me? <laughs> yes. And he goes and he lays out this little skinny arm and I put my big old head on that arm. <laughs> There's something that happens when we allow ourselves to sit inside freedom, sit inside transparency, sit inside what I like to call carefrontation. Hmm. 
That means I might push up against you a little bit. I might make you mildly to moderately to significantly uncomfortable in any form of mediocrity. But it's out of the spirit of love. You want to inspire people with your voice from your child to your sibling, to your significant other, to your community, to the world, to this room. Be willing to love me enough to tell me your truth. Then love me enough to tell me my truth. Then love me enough to just tell me the truth. And, and find, find, be willing to touch the edge of your own comfort zone. You show me yours and I'll show you mine. You show me your heart, and I'll show you my love. You let me know that you're willing to be imperfect and still have a perfectly giving, serving, loving life, then you give me permission to let my imperfection out into the world too. See, you want to speak at another level? You got to be willing to love at another level, forgive at another level, show up at another level, speak up at another level, pray at another level. You have to be willing on every level to up level who you be on a daily basis. Rule number two, live your quest. When we talk about living our quest, <clears throat> um, I, I think that living my quest, really if I look at it on a daily basis, it's finding my own voice. It's finding your voice. It's finding the song that only you can sing, off key or not. It's finding your rhythm. It's discovering what it feels like to walk in your shoes today. It won't look like it looked 10 years ago. Living your quest is what can I do with my life so that my life becomes infectious to someone else? Living my quest looks like how do I make my fingerprint matter so big that it lives beyond my transition day. Living your quest is how can I forgive the perceivingly unforgivable so I can love the absolute lovable. Living your quest is how do I give myself a thousand second chances and every time I get to 999, press reset. Yeah, yeah. Living my quest is, is not some ambiguous, untouchable experience. Living my quest means going back and healing the little girl in me so that the woman can be free. It's going back and embracing the little boy in you so that the man can show up and give himself permission to cry when necessary. Living your quest is not something that you can't touch. It's not something that requires a stage or lights or cameras. Living your quest is being complete and content with who you are in the dark of the night. So who you are in the middle of the day is all right. Living your quest is as simple as it is complex. Living your quest is about giving yourself permission, say permission, permission. on a daily basis to become the next best version of yourself. Living your quest is not holding yourself hostage to old decisions, not holding yourself hostage to shame, blame, guilt, regret, and anger. Living your quest is about recognizing that every day I can be reborn to my possibility. Rule number three, be transparent. The Oprah team had heard some of my backstory. And they said, can we send a camera crew, much like this wonderful camera crew, yes. Not nearly as good looking. Um, <laughs> and can we send a camera crew to capture your story? And so I, I shared my story. And I mean, I dumped and dumped. And I shared the ugly. And right after the interview, I regretted it. Because I, I didn't think I could be the secret teacher, the expert, and have that kind of ugly out there in the world. I didn't know. I didn't know that the world would love me for what I've come through. I thought that they would they would consider me an imposter in the secret. And so I shared all this junk. Two weeks later, I'm on my way to Oprah to do the actual recording, and I know what I record, I know the video. So the night before, I'm packing and I'm crying. I'm like, oh, that, it's over tomorrow. It's all over. <laughs> I'm gonna go embarrass myself uh, on it's, Oprah. It's the, yeah. it's the fastest career up and down <laughs> anyone's ever seen. Lisa Nichols will be the secret, yes. right? So. <laughs> Um, 
So I, I, I'm just sad. I'm scared. And I and I call a friend of mine at 4, 15 in the morning because I stayed up all night. Of course, yeah. How are you going to sleep yeah, before that? Yeah, right, right. And I said, I'm I, I, I there to go to my junk and the video and I'm, it's over. And he said, can I pray for you, Lisa? And I was like, sure. My friend says, God, thank you for using your imperfect child to help your imperfect children. I went to Oprah the next day, and as the chatter kept going in my head, leading up to the moment when they play this video, I'm like, it's okay. I'm enough. I'm enough with all my mess. I'm enough. I'm enough. And the chatter kept, nope, they're gonna find out. They're gonna find out your son's father is in jail. They're gonna find out that, they're gonna find out. And I thought, no, they're not gonna find out because I'm gonna tell them. Because there's power in transparency. There's power in authenticity. There's power in truth. That I'm gonna speak life into someone else because they're gonna see who I am because of that, in spite of that, with that. And so then the after show came. So after the regular Oprah show, the after show. And man, I cracked open on the after show. (laughs) And within 72 hours, talk about the power of transparency and authenticity. Within 72 hours, I received 8,782 emails. And my email wasn't even Lisa Nichols. It wasn't even easy to find. And my website wasn't Lisa Nichols. Yeah. They, people searching for me. Whatever it took. Because of the truth. And so I had the imposter syndrome then. I've had it since then. People told me, oh my God, you're the answer. And I'm searching for my own answers. Rule number four, serve at a high level. See, it's very difficult to speak phenomenally and to not be good. Come on, y'all from yesterday. Not be great, but to be what? Unfreaking forgettable. It's difficult to be unforgettable while you're still trying to look good. <laughs> you can't do two things as chasing two rabbits. See, unforgettable has everything to do with serving at a level so high, so big, so massive that people feel like they have to change their lives because they crossed your path. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. See, see, when you're willing to use your voice, first you have to recognize that you have one. You got to recognize that, that no matter your past, you were given a voice and the, your voice was given not to keep to yourself. Your voice is not a secret, says the secret teacher. <laughs> and you have to be willing to use every experience that's ever happened in your life, not as a fortress holding you from using your voice, but as the fuel on why you will use your voice. You got to be willing to not stand in your story, but stand on your story. Yes, yes. It's not in spite of your past that you get to be amazing, that you get to be a change agent, that you get to transform lives. It's because of your past that you're perfect for such a job. When you own it like that, see, there's no question in my certainty about my life. Can you walk with that level of certainty so that when the wind comes and then when the wind blows and it will come and it will blow and it will be a storm and it will be a tornado and it will look like divorce and it will look like bankruptcy and it will look like an illness and it will look like a loss. When it comes, it will rock you. It will rock you. It will rock you, but it won't move you. Also, if you want to have more self-confidence and self-belief, the science says it can take up to 200 and 54 days of consecutive action for the habit to stick. And that's what I want for you. So I've designed a custom free program where I'm gonna send you an unlisted video for the next 254 days to shift your confidence and belief forward. The link to join is in the description below. We validate who we are by what we're doing for other people. So many times I get the question, how do I prevent failure? And I'd love for you to spend that same energy going, How could I ensure that I soar? Cognitive dissonance is when you have literally thought about a a version of yourself that you're not currently living right now. Rule number five, reinvent yourself. To the conversation about money and wealth, um, it's one being willing to release a familiar now for an unfamiliar future. Now that's, that's easier said than done, yes. and it's bigger than it sounds. 
Are you willing to have your future look unfamiliar and in some cases look around and you don't recognize anything? Are you willing? Are you so tied to the comfort of what you know, even in its discomfort? So I was willing to reinvent myself a thousand times. Are you willing to reinvent yourself? Are you willing to introduce yourself to the new version of you? Yes. Are you willing to go places you wouldn't go and do things that you traditionally wouldn't do? See, I wasn't traditionally in meditation or in visualization or hanging around older white men or like I had a, a thousand things that I didn't do traditionally. Rule number six, take care of yourself. Whenever we have guilt about feeding ourselves, serving ourselves, giving ourselves anything that we need. We need to look at that closer. I used to say I felt guilty about having self-care and doing self-care because of what it took away from Jelani, my son, or what it took away from my parents, or what it may have taken away from my clients. But the reality was, it was simply the need for more personal development. For me to understand, I'm not only worthy, you're not only worthy of success and abundance, you're worthy of self-care. <laughs> like it sounds so different because we're so used to running after, you know, an abundant life, running after the riches of life, whatever those riches are, with the riches in relationships, riches in financing, riches in health and wellness. But you rarely see someone running after self-care because it's actually so available to us. It's a choice. And so it's easier for us to hide behind those other things when in fact, Self-care is just as much our birthright. And we have to look at it just like we look at abundance because we have to make a decision to give ourselves permission to have a healthy relationship, healthy lifestyle, financial abundance, and self-care. That self-care is a demonstration of self-love. So self-care is a guilt-free act. Self-care is being responsible for your future. That you wouldn't dare get on a road trip that says it was 300 miles down the road. Look at your gas tank and see that you had 105 miles worth of gas in it. You would literally go and fill your tank up. Self-care is being responsible to your entire journey to go and fill your tank up. Rule number seven, set healthy boundaries. To set healthy boundaries, you can't just make an announcement. I've been looking at the Lisa Nichols show and I know you won't say it like that, but things have got to change. No, don't announce it like that. Don't announce it with that, what I call that stank energy on it. Don't announce it with that negative, I'm done, you've been using me. You, no, 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 again, they simply have signed up for the game that you created the relationship that you created, which was, I'm going to give, you can receive, you don't ever have to worry about crossing a boundary with me. So the first thing you need to do is to set the record straight by apologizing to the people that you've allowed to cross your boundaries. You have to say, I apologize, just say it just like this, just quote me, just, just like this. You don't have to say, you quote me, just even, it's your own words, you can modify it as need be. But you know what, I owe you an apology. I owe you an apology because I've made you think that I have no boundaries. I've led you to believe that I don't need rest. What I've done is I've, I've overused my yes. And so I'm not used to saying no, and you're not used to hearing no from me. I've even said yes to you when I needed to say no. And what I know about you is that you would want me happy. So I apologize. I set something in motion that doesn't even work for me. I love you, I know you love me, and I love the relationship, but I need to make some tweaks. I did this. Don't do it in any passive aggressive way that indirectly blames them. No, own your stuff. You are a leader. Own your mess, own your choices, own the results. I had to do it. Hold on, I set everyone up to believe that I can handle everything. I kind of like being the hero of the story. It was my ego or my self-esteem that needed to be fed for the last 10 years. And now I've grown up enough to realize I don't need that. And so in this new season, I need to set healthier boundaries. It's not about you. You never saw my line, so you didn't know that you were crossing it. You never saw the boundaries, so you didn't know where they, they existed. That's on me. Ooh, now that's grown folk talk. 
That's grown folk talk, that's adult, that's emotional literacy at its best. So I know it might make your knees knock, it might make your teeth chatter, but pull up your big boy pants, pull up your big girl pants and make it happen. Because on the other side of that is the experience that you deserve and the one that you're looking for. But it first requires you to do the work. In a previous episode, I talked about your Popeye muscle. That's the thing you've been doing for a long time already. That's the letting everyone cross your boundaries. That's the saying yes to everyone. And then there's that olive oil muscle. You know, the muscle that hangs down here because it's underdeveloped. That's that setting healthy boundaries muscle. That's that apologizing for how you've shown up and allowed other people to not even see your boundary. That's owning it. Oh, yeah, I know. It can be intense, but it's so incredibly beneficial. So let's do it. Let's reclaim your boundaries. Let's reclaim your joy. Let's reclaim your life. Let's reclaim your future. Let's reclaim and design it in a way that serves everybody. Because when you do this, you will model for those who are witnessing you. You will model, people won't choose to be out of relationship with you because you apologize for never setting boundaries. It'll be a little disruptive. It'll be a little uncomfortable. It'll be a little new. And then they'll settle in it. And then we know something new. And then you've inspired others to do the same. Rule number eight, be inspired by the thorns. I look at my life as a young woman in South Central LA, living between the Harlem Crip 30s and the Rolling 60s. Those are not cheerleading squads, (laughs) y'all. Having three fights a week to get home from school, and that was the easy part. The hard part was the fact that my highest grade in school was a C plus. See, when some of you brought home C's, your parents were frustrated. When I brought home a C, my parents were excited because I was severely dyslexic in school. So I, it took me a lot longer to learn. The last time I took an English class, I got a fail. And my English teacher said, Lisa, you have to be the weakest writer I've ever met in my entire life. I said, does, does that come with an award? Because I am kind of collecting rewards. And the last time I took a speech class, my speech teacher gave me a D minus and said, quote, unquote, unquote, Miss Nichols, I recommend that you never speak in public, that you get a desk job. (laughs) And what it showed me was that some of your best motivation might come wrapped in sandpaper. Some of your best inspiration comes with some pricks and some nails and some thorns around it. Some of your best inspiration came in an experience that you didn't ask for, you didn't want, and you'd never want to have again. Some of your best inspiration, some of the very thing that's fueled your soul to get you here, came in an experience that you dare not wish on your enemy. You dare not wish on anyone. But yet it still fueled you to come and step inside your quest. So when you ask the question, am I on the right path, how can you not be if you can still see light? How can you not be? Rule number nine, be willing to walk alone. Also, on your way to wealth, you got to be willing to walk alone sometimes. Amen. You Amen gotta be willing. to that, my You got to be willing to walk alone sometimes because Amen. everyone doesn't fit on your journey at every part of your journey. And there's parts of your vision that no one else will get. And when no one else gets your vision, remind yourself, no one else gets your vision because God didn't give your vision to them. God gave your vision to you. And that's all you got to know. And it's your job to be the midwife the birthing agent, it's your wife, it's your job to be the nursing station, it's your job to be the doctor, the delivery doctor, to bring that vision out so the world can see it. That's your job. No one has to see it or get it while it's here, while it's here, while it's here. It's your job to birth it. It's your job to give it arms. It's your job to give it oxygen. And it's your job to be patient enough to know that it won't happen overnight. Just like a child, when a baby is threatening to be born in five months, the doctor says, hold on, bed rest. The lungs aren't developed. Hold on, bed rest. The heart isn't strong enough. Hold on, bed rest. The muscles aren't. Same thing about your dream. So when you get impatient about your dream, it's only because you're comparing your dream and your journey to somebody else's journey. Yes. It's only because. And, and Benjamin Franklin says comparison is and will always be the thief of all your joy. Wow. So don't I look left. That. Don't look left. Don't look right. Just look straight ahead. People always say, Lisa, how'd you do it? I wasn't looking left and right. I wasn't keeping notes on what Tony was doing or what Jack was doing. I love him, yeah. but I'm busy. I'm busy building my dreams. I'll stop and have dinner with you. I'll stop and, 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 and bump elbows with you, but I'm not going to compare my life, my joy, my success, and what's my divine right to yours. Nor am I going to minimize my light or my brightness for anyone as well. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is become 
a force. There becomes a time when you no longer fit in your old story. I think that day is today. That, that there's, a new, there's a new part two trying to be born for you. And it, it requires you to own every part of the past, but own every part of the possibility. And on the other side of that, the diamonds that will drop out of your mouth, the, the diamonds that will come birthing from your soul, the seeds that will be planted and the harvest that will grow, you will be barely recognizable. But better than that are the people around you, how their lives will shift. Because when you change you, it's just one person. But when you become a force to be reckoned with, then your voice permeates over 800 people or so. Now I've got a really special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week? The science says that when you just watch a video, you get motivated, you get inspired, you have a 35% chance of following through on your goals. 35%, that's not enough. That's not enough just to get motivated. Believe Nation, we're here, you're here. The today matters, you're an action taker. When you commit to a plan of action of when and how you're gonna follow through, when you write it down, you have a 91% chance of following through. And when you commit publicly to somebody else, it jumps to 95% chance. From 30 something percent to 95% chance of you following through. Believe Nation, we need to make this happen. So question of the day, your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action specific for the next week. Put it down in the comments below and I'm gonna show on screen sometime next week to celebrate you. I love this question. I don't think I've ever been asked this question before. I've never had an opportunity to explain it. Being the best version of you. First of all, it's not, don't think of it holistic. I want you to break it down to different parts of your life. Because when you are committed to being the best version of you, which in summary, it's the you that you're so incredibly proud of holistically. It's a 360 approach. It says, I'm not perfect. So best, does not mean the perfect version of you. Because I think perfection and balance are two illusions that are designed to help you keep chasing something that's not even attainable. So perfect is not attainable and balance is not attainable. So it's perfectly managing my imperfection and releasing balance and having harmony, number one. But the best version of you is really saying that in each area of my life, I'm in movement. In each area of my life, I'm in evolution. In each area of my life, I'm active. I am actively participating in an upwardly way, in an upwardly mobile way in this area of my life, times every area of my life. It doesn't necessarily mean that there, you're always where you want to be but it does mean that you're being responsible, you're being active and you're being proactive. Finances, that you're looking at your numbers just this morning, just this morning. I ran my credit score again. I wanna see what's on it. I want to be actively participating in my financial growth. I looked at my savings. I looked at my life insurance. I, I just looked at my, my long-term plan. Not necessarily because I wanna buy another house or I wanna buy a car. I just wanna be on top of it. I want to be responsible for and then health and wellness just yesterday I was talking to Matt and going Matt it's time for us to do another health and wellness campaign I don't necessarily want to do it and it slightly to moderately scares me a bit when I'm bringing my fitness into a public conversation but I know the responsible me, the best version of Lisa, is saying, hold me accountable. Hold me accountable to my fitness goals. Hold me accountable to my total wellness goals. And then last week, I was just sitting with someone saying, you know what, I need to go down the list of all the checkups that I've had. I need to make sure I'm not missing anything. Relationships. I just said to a girlfriend yesterday, hold me accountable. Hold me accountable to not running. <laughs> I realize that I run well and I run smoothly. I run like a gazelle sometimes when it comes to relationships. You don't, it doesn't even look like I'm running because I'm so busy. So I asked someone who knows me, who knows the love that I want, who knows my sexy excuses, I need you to hold me accountable. When I say this, I want you to question it. And so while there's so much growth in every area of my life, 
I'm being the best version that I know to be because I'm active in every single area. I'm not saying I'm being the best or I am the best. Please don't get me wrong with that. I'm just saying to be the best version of myself. So when you look at being the best version of yourself, look at each part of your life and go, what am I actively doing? Where you feel like I'm in the game in this area. I'm not resigned and I'm not praying for it to go right. Or I'm not in resignation and in complaint about it. I'm not a victim to that relationship. I'm not a victim to my finances. I'm not a victim to the relationships in my family. I'm an active part of creating what's occurring. And it can always get better, but I'm an active part. That's being the best version of you. And waking up each morning and saying, I like me today. I got many things I can work on, but I like me today. Before you ever go out on Facebook or any other social media platform to check to see if anyone else like you, your job is to like you first. And every other like is bonus. That's stepping into the best version version of you. Setting long-term goals that make your knees knock a little bit and make your teeth chatter a little bit. Those goals that you don't know exactly how you're going to get it done, but it's something that you want to get done. It doesn't, it stretches you, but it doesn't stress you. Your goals are supposed to stretch you, not stress you. Those things, that combination. And when you live in that capacity and you focus and you operate in that one, that's when you're living and being the best version of you. I love to go back and share some of my favorite memories with you, my fondest. And what I realized, they're actually my most moving memories. One happened over 12 years ago. I was in Toronto, Canada with Margaret. And this gentleman walked up to me, standing about six foot two, Caucasian man in his mid forties. And he looked at me and he goes, Lisa, I have a problem with you. I said, you do? And my heart started to beat. I'm like, oh my God, someone doesn't like me. What did I say wrong in their eyes? And what, how is this gonna play out? And he goes, I have a problem. I, have a, I really have a problem. And I said, okay, how can I help you? He said, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. I'm fine not believing in God. I'm comfortable, I prefer not to believe in God. I don't believe that there's a God. And I said, okay. What's your problem? He said, my problem is, I love you. I love everything about you. I love the energy you come with. I love the way you speak. I love what I feel when I'm listening to you talk. He said, and you keep referring to this God as your source. And I don't believe in God. So that's my problem. And I said, sir, I'm sorry. I'm not sure where your problem lies. I said, if, if you don't believe in God, you have that right. If you love me, I'm excited because you can feel that I love you too. And he looked at me and he goes, so let me get this straight. This is not the part where you try to convert me or try to tell me how wrong I am or you try to explain to me about your God so that I can begin to believe like you believe. This is, this is not that part, you're not gonna do that? And I looked up at him, I said, why would I do that? You're committed to whatever you believe in. My job is to honor your belief system. And he goes, see, you're doing that thing again that's making me love you more. That's my problem. But I know you believe in God. I said, that's not a problem. Why don't you keep believing in me and loving me? I'll keep believing in God and loving God. And we'll keep having this great experience. After I said that, he just grabbed me. And he hugged me and he held me. And I knew somehow he was holding on to possibility. That's what I choose to tell myself. He was holding on to the love that he could feel for me, the palatable, non-judgmental, non-persecuting love. And in that moment, I couldn't feel more joy. As I held that man, I couldn't feel more joy. I, I, I couldn't feel more happiness that this is what ministry is about. This is what touching souls is about, is, is to love the person who thinks that you might not love them because their belief system. It was just so beautiful. The moment was so beautiful. I mean, he held me. And then he drew back and looked at me. And he said, you're the real deal. And I looked up at him. 
And I said, so are you. And we said our goodbyes. I never saw him again. Margaret and I went up to the room, our hotel room, that night. And replaying what happened, we both just started to bawl, just cry. And I said to Margaret, Margaret, this is Marketplace Ministry disguised as a business. I'm not in the converting business. I don't need to convert anybody. You're exactly where you choose to be. But I am in the loving business. My job is to love you where you are. And that beautiful gentleman, that day, he reminded me and Margaret, I believe, what unconditional love could feel like. You know, when you want to learn how to trust your intuition more, you know, I say, and this is me and my walk and my, my belief system, that your intuition is your internal GPS system, your internal God placement system. It's that whisper, and sometimes it's that scream that tells you to leap or to be still. Your intuition is a combination of spirit, emotion, and logic, and it's guiding you. And so often we don't hear our intuition. Why don't we hear it? Because we're having too much chatter in our head. Like the chatter in our head, doubt, worry, judgment, oh my God, judgment, or fear, fear of other people's perception of you. So your intuition is saying, I love to dance, I wanna dance, I wanna sing. Your intuition is saying, we can have a great time. Your intuition is saying, I want love. Your intuition is saying, gosh, let's go take that chance on that writing that book, or let's take that chance on starting that business. And then your chatter comes in. No, what if I fail? So let me explain this to you. Your mind, your brain is designed to keep you safe. It's designed and it only has the ability to go back in time in the mental file cabinet and look at the last time you tried something like this and it may not have been um, good or it may have ended in some dangerous situations uh, where people could judge you and your brain is designed to protect you. That's it, your brain is designed to protect you, it's logical. Your intuition is that spark of passion. It's that spark of desire. It's that spark of love. It's that spark of pull me forward. It's that little bit of radical. It's that lot of bit of, uh, um, of, of I want to leave my fingerprint on this planet. Your brain isn't designed to have those same ideas now. Now, your intuition can kick the brain in and the brain can start thinking of ways too, but the intuition is where it's going to start. It's in your gut. It's, in your, it's why when you feel something, you kind of go here. You don't go, oh, I feel so special. You don't say I feel special here. You say I feel it here, I feel it here. And so your job is not to turn down the doubt. Your job is to turn up the passion. It's to turn up the faith. It's to turn up the possibility. Now, still make well thought out plans. I always say the best plan is the plan made. I don't care if you have to upgrade it, you have to modify it, but if you, if, you, if, you, if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. So every dream, every passion, every desire, follow it with a plan, because that's where your brain gets excited. Your brain goes, yeah, we got a plan now. Now you can believe yourself. See, you set big goals and dreams and you have desires and then you don't achieve it, but you don't achieve it because you didn't set the plan in place. You didn't do the details. And then you stop believing you could do it. And then you do the biggest tragedy. You stop dreaming. You stop hoping. You stop stretching yourself. You stop listening to your GPS, your God placement system that says you've been put here on a divine assignment and your assignment may change over years. Guess what? Your assignment you had 15 years ago may be very different from the assignment on your life today. Your job is to turn down the volume in your head. The volume of judgment, the volume of fear, the volume of worry, the volume of um, perfection. Turn down the volume in your head and turn up the volume in your intuition, in your solar plex in that God placement system, in that heart space, turn up the volume in that place that just says, what do I want? What? Ask yourself this tonight, today, tomorrow. 
what feels good to my soul. And then be still and be quiet. I believe, I believe in prayer and I believe in meditation. And I grew up only knowing about prayer. But then I learned that prayer is asking God or the divine, whatever you call your God, I'm not imposing my belief systems on you, but I call him God. That prayer is asking God for direction. And meditation is being still and quiet long enough to hear the answer. A lot of times we don't hear our intuitive spirit talking to us because we're not still and we're not quiet long enough to hear it. So give yourself the gift of quiet time. And really, after you've asked the question, what brings me joy? What excites my soul? What do I want to do for the next six months or six years? What makes me feel passionate? What sets me on fire? And then be still and then listen. But the biggest question is, will you be bold enough to act on what you hear? Mm. I ain't going nowhere. So I want to hear what happens. I want to hear what you heard. I want to hear what came up for you. I want to hear what stirred your soul. I want to hear how excited you got. I want to hear about the feelings that begin to pulse through your entire body when you listened to your GPS, when you listened to that calling in your soul. I want to know because that's when the hair on the back of your neck stands up. That's when you get chicken skin. That's when you can't sleep at night. That's when you get up early. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I love the phrase willpower. But willpower isn't something you conjure up. Willpower isn't something you drink. Willpower isn't something you download from Google. What you're talking about is how do I make the choices that are in alignment with my highest purpose and my highest vision for myself. That's what you really wanna ask. See, your life is a physical manifestation of the choices that you made up until this moment. I'm gonna say that again, cause that gets a little deep. And that can go over some people's head. That can hit you sometimes right between the eyes and you gotta hear it a second time. So here it goes. Your life right now, as it exists today, your finances, your weight, your relationships, your career, your self-esteem, your self-image, your spiritual awareness, all of that is a result of the choices that you've made up until this moment big and small. And just so you know, your life, the way it appears today, is not a result of a few big choices. Even though that's the thing that we look back on, we go, ah, oh, I shouldn't have moved out of the state. Ah, oh, I shouldn't have got into that relationship. Ah, oh, I shouldn't have. We look at the big things. Well, I'm here to disrupt that mindset a bit. Your life experience right now is not so much a result of your big choices, why those impact you. It's really a result of a bunch of small little choices made consistently over a long period of time. Because those are the habits and the behaviors that you've gotten into. So we can talk about willpower and how do I build willpower as if it's something that you can flex in the gym or something you can do crunches or abs or triceps and build, but it's not. The question you should ask, the answer you should be seeking is what does it take to make my choices become in alignment with the life that I say I wanna live. Now when you say choices, it makes it really sobering because even when you choose to sit down on yourself, it was a choice. So I ask you in this moment, what will it take you to decide to make the choice today? Don't even think about tomorrow, don't think about next week, but to make the choice today that's in alignment with your health goals. Make a choice today that's in alignment with your financial goals. It's the small things. It's the extra visit to Starbucks. It's the extra biscuit. It's the getting up early. It's 10 more crunches. It's doing squats every time you go to the bathroom. At least that's what I do. I do 10. I do 10 every time I go to the restroom. I'm already there. I'm just going to keep on going just because I want to stay in alignment with my goal. And my goal is to have a body that at least creates a double take or or a triple take, maybe. I don't know. I wanted to create a body that is in alignment with my goal. I want to be able to go paintballing with my nephews and my son the way I just did recently. I want to be able to go jet skiing. So when I look at my life and my lifestyle that I want to maintain, it requires me to hike a little longer. It requires me to eat more vegetables and protein. It requires me, my, my choice of how I want to live requires my alignment in what I put in my body or how I stay active in my body. So when I date, 
I don't, I don't do dinner dates. I'm not interested in doing dinner dates. You wanna date me? Let's go on a hike. Let's go skating, ice skating, roller skating. Let's go on a walk. I, I want active dates in my dating experience because that's in alignment with my life's purpose. So, what are you choosing? Let's not even look at willpower. Let's look at choices. Because choice is something you can control in every single moment. And the choice you made yesterday, if it wasn't in alignment with your greatest goal and your highest purpose, okay, yesterday is yesterday. Make a new choice today. You're not ever condemned or sentenced to making the same choice over and over and over again. Every day, every moment, you have a new opportunity to make a new choice. So divorce yourself from the conversation, that's who I've always been. And divorce yourself from the conversation, well, Lisa, it's hard. Yeah, listen, me. Mediocracy is crowded. Everybody's hanging out in mediocrity. But excellence, world class, <laughs> it's a lot of room up there. So it's only for those who are willing to be mildly to moderately to maybe significantly inconvenienced by making the choice that's in the highest alignment with the highest version of themselves. So let's just put away willpower and let's pick up choice. And then let's make a choice that blows your mind. If you find that the relationships around you have toxic outcomes, then I want you to look at where's the breakdown. Is the breakdown in communication? Is the breakdown in how you communicate, the words you're using? Is the breakdown in who you choose to be around? Is the breakdown in the engagement of what you're talking about? What I've learned is that if you're not talking about things that are high enough and big enough, things that are inspiring enough, you will slip into the smallness every single time. If you don't choose an intentionally high, evolving, encouraging conversation, you will slip into the cracks. You will slip into those crevices of smallness and petty. And until you get people trained that you're going to live up here without telling them, I need you to know, it's not an announcement. It's a way of being. It's a what do you choose to participate in. It's a stepping over your desire to hear smallness. Uh, gossip, um, uh, negative feedback. It's when someone is engaging in negative feedback about someone else, the fact that you didn't add anything to the conversation doesn't let you off the hook. Did you stop the conversation? Did you say, hold on, I don't want to engage in speaking negatively of them at all. Why don't you have a conversation with them? It's course correcting behaviors in your space at the risk, at the risk of losing the relationship. But what you basically do is, is you say, here's where I play. Here is where I live. I'm not visiting this high road of integrity. I'm not visiting this high road of conscious thinking and awareness and respect and humility and, and honoring the dignity of people. I don't visit this place. I live here. I don't visit this place. I live here. And in a loving way, anyone that's engaging with you has two choices. They either engage with you here or they choose to engage with someone else. Now, if you find that you're going down to be in the relationship or you're going down and you're taking and you're the person taking the relationship down because you're in a moment of anger or you're in a moment of resentment or you're in a moment of hurt, then you're not living in your highest integrity. You just visit every now and again when you come to this channel. Uh Oh, I see my 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 Shantae coming out right now. Shantae is my middle name. It's what I do when I start getting real edgy because I really want you to get it. So you need to make a decision on where you choose to reside. And then you don't leave your conscious neighborhood to go visit other people's neighborhood if it's not as high as yours. People will rise to the occasion or they'll choose not to rise and they'll pick other people to be with and hang with. And I know that sounds easier said than done because some of the people who are playing at a lower level might be in family. It might be, and that's fine too. You can love people. It doesn't mean you have to spend tons and tons and tons of time if that time costs you something. Spend as much time as you can. Spend as much time as serves you. Spend as much time as they will allow you to spend. But never leave this place. Even if being with them causes you to to allow them to be where they are, you don't have to engage in that. So the bottom line in supporting you to either recognize are you the toxic element, are you surrounding yourself in toxic element, is to make a commitment where you live. Where am I living? And first own where you're currently living because if you own it, you might go, you know what, I do slip into that small place. Okay, own it. That's conscious awareness. That's powerful. Own it. And then go, where do I want to be? 
And then what's the distance between here and there? And what do I have to do to get there? What do I have to say no to? What do I have to participate in? What do I have to ask forgiveness for? What do I have to clean up? What relationships require cleaning up? And then what declarations must I make? And what decisions must I live in? Don't make a decision, live in your decision. Let me first explain to you what forgiveness isn't. Because most people won't forgive because they have an incorrect understanding of what forgiveness is. So forgiveness is not pardoning someone's behavior. It's not excusing someone's behavior. Forgiveness isn't admitting that you were wrong. Forgiveness isn't saying what was done to me is okay. Forgiveness isn't any of those things. Forgiveness actually, if you really understand it, it has less to do with the other person and more to do with you and more to do with your future. Let's go back to the oil and water scenario. So forgiveness invites in love, invites in possibility, invites in prosperity, it invites in new thinking, it invites in creativity. So forgiveness is an expanding emotion. When you forgive, you're opened up for new things. Anger is a contracting emotion. It requires you to shut down, to avoid, to shut out, to stop talking. Everything in anger is about stopping and shutting down. Everything about forgiveness is about opening up without pardoning someone's behavior. I wanna make sure I'm clear on that because most people attach forgiveness to, but you don't know what he did, but you don't know what she did. When you can detach, forgiveness is not about what they did. Forgiveness, get this, Forgiveness is about making yourself available. Think about you. your body is primary real estate. There's only so much of it. It's a finite, it's a finite space. There's only so much space. It's not forever, but it, this is your body. This, so if this is your primary real estate, if this is your primary real estate, your heart, and you're, you have anger occupying 20% of it, you can never experience 100% love. You can never experience 100% possibility. You haven't given yourself a chance at 100% of the things you want most because your primary real estate, your heart, your body, your mind is being occupied with a very intrusive, toxic emotion. Less and less about them. Nothing to do with them being right or their behavior being pardoned or the action. It's your, your future is paying for your past when you hold on to anger. So when you get really connected to the cost of anger, then it's not about the what. A matter of fact, the longer you've been angry, the longer you've robbed yourself of 100% of what you were, were worthy of. And if someone's betrayed you, if someone's hurt you, then you over everyone deserve 100% love, 100% possibility, 100%, but it requires forgiveness. And in many cases, it's forgiveness of yourself. In many cases, the person you've been angry at the longest is yourself. And the same rule applies when it comes to you. Over the years, I've had to learn how to disconnect myself from people, how to pull away, how to move on without what I call Benihana in people. Now, I don't know if you remember, but if you ever go to a Benihana restaurant, they have those sharp knives and they kind of go and you don't even know that the zucchini is like all diced up until they move it and then everything is cut apart. Well, I used to, have a habit of like cutting people off so well so fast that I felt like I Benny haunted them like they didn't know they were like all sliced and diced until they went to walk away and their head fell off <laughs> and then their arms fell off and I over the years I had to learn how do I complete by the way I would say don't break up with people don't break away from people don't stop being their friends a better mindset is recognize when the relationship is just complete. Now I say complete, say complete with me. When I say complete, that means the relationship has had every experience that it needs to have. You've done everything you need to do and it's just complete. So you don't have to make people wrong. That was a big lesson for me because we're taught that in order for relationships to end, someone's brains need to be splattered on the ceiling. Well, 
The older, wiser me recognizes that I can end relationships from people who I've outgrown or people who might be toxic or people who are just not a fit for me and also leave their dignity intact. Key word. I want you to write that down, type that in chat, because there is a way that you can complete with people. Notice I'm using these key words with you. You can complete with people, meaning every experience that we need to have, we've had. And now I'm complete. That you can do that and leave their dignity intact. You can say this relationship has run its course. You don't have to outline everything that's not working because you know when we outline things that are not working, all we're doing is making people wrong. So let me just say, the way you complete a relationship is to first check your ego. Because your ego, or ladies, your she-go, whoo, they will get in the way and what you want to do is point, 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 point. I'm, I'm done with you because of this this and this and we all know when you point one finger over there the three fingers point back at you we've all heard it but more importantly than that is can you give people the gift if you're really on this journey called transformation can you give people the gift of completing a relationship with them while leaving their dignity intact let me show you how because I had to learn this one so you want to write this down so number one when you go into a relationship, when you, when you go into a conversation, number one, when you go into a conversation that needs a course correction or that you're gonna complete with, you don't wanna go in and say, I have to talk to you about something. Something isn't working. Because you're neutral, so you go into that relationship already at zero. You're neutral. Now follow me with this, you gotta really pay attention, so eliminate all distractions right now. You don't wanna go into a relationship that's gonna be difficult at neutral. You want to go into the relationship at plus, 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 okay? So you might hear some noise in the background. Don't worry about that. I'm sitting in my backyard. It's summertime. I have kids playing. It's summertime. They're free. Waterfalls are flowing. So I'm not going to bother to stop the recording so we have a perfect situation. Life ain't perfect. I'm going to keep going because you need this lesson like some people need life at times, right? So... You go into a conversation at zero when you say, I need to talk to you about something. Instead, I want you to think of it this way. When you go in at zero and then you say, what's, go what's wrong? I need to talk to you. This doesn't work for me. This doesn't work for me. Every time you say this doesn't work for me, you go down one notch. Negative one, negative two, negative three, right? Most people do that. Almost everyone does that. Look, we need to talk. As Soon as you say that, people are like, oh, what? And then you go on to all the things that doesn't work, that don't work for you, right? Well, that takes them down. Negative one, negative two, negative three. You never get back up, which is why brain splatter ends up on the ceiling because you can never get up to neutral again. You you started and you took them down and you, you guys couldn't get back out. Let's try this. So I want you to get a piece of paper out and I want you to write zero and draw a line like 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 it's a it's a it's a guiding line and write zero right in the center of that line. And then write negative one, negative two, negative three below the line. Instead of starting with I need to talk to you about something and going into what's wrong, I want you to start every challenging conversation and I want you to take them up, plus them. Think about it, plus three me, plus three me, plus three me, right? Which means I need to talk to you about something. First of all, what I want to tell you is what I love about you, plus one. What I respect about you is, plus two. What I appreciate and honor you for, plus three. What I realize is that I'm really complete with this relationship. There are parts of it that's not serving me anymore and it's time for me to move on, plus two. I need to love you from a distance. I just need space, plus one. And um, I need that space to begin now. Zero. Still a hard conversation. But now you've ended at zero versus negative three. Still not easy to have. I didn't say it was going to be easy. But when you plus three me, 
you actually add value and add energy to who I am and affirming me. Because even in the worst relationship, even in the most negative situation, you can find things to love people for, to appreciate them for, and to honor them for. And then they're the things that doesn't that don't work. Plus three me, and then course correct me. Plus three me, and then complete with me. Plus three me before you do anything else. So in any conversation with a, a coworker, with a child, with a loved one, with a romantic, a romantic interest, with a friend, plus three me, and then let's manage what can be fixed, adjusted, or shifted in our relationship. Remember. This is not a monologue. No way, Jose. I am not interested in being the only person talking here. I want to hear from you. Your words mean everything. I think what makes this channel so unique and so delicious and so dynamic is the conversations that we have in chat around the videos, around the messages. I would love to hear from you. What conversation have you had in the past and you needed this technique. What conversation is up for you to have in the future? And you are so glad that you now have this technique. Remember, plus three me, plus, 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 then go down and course correct. Most importantly, in every conversation, remember to leave their dignity intact. That's what you owe, not them, but that's what you owe the person that you've committed to being. Every single thing you touch is impacted by your story. As an attorney, as a teacher, as an architect, there's not one line of business that you can be in that a story and a great story won't elevate your outcome. Every single line of business, every single line of service that you're connected to will be impacted and ideally elevated by the level in which you're willing to tell and share your story. So let me give you some guidelines, some parameters, what I like to call the bumper rails, as if you were going bowling. You know, when I go bowling, I ask them to put the little bumper rails down so I can stay, my, my ball can get down the lane. So let me set up some bumper rails for you um, so that you understand what makes a great story. So one is the willingness to take risk. Most people, Vision, when they're telling a story, they don't want to take a risk. So the story has, it has its limits on how high it'll go or how deep it'll go. And when you have that, then you're really not at that part that's going to touch my soul. So being willing to take a risk, being clear and concise with your stories. A great story is a show me story, not a tell me story. Now, this is the distinction that's the game changer for most. Most people are telling a story. They say, um, so let me just share with you a little bit of my story and I'll tell you and then I'll show you. So as I was building my life, um, there was a time in my life that was very difficult. It was very challenging. True story. Very difficult, very challenging, very uncomfortable. I didn't have a lot of money. Um, I didn't have a lot of hope and things just looked dismal. At some point, I had to turn my life around. At some point, I made the decision that life had to get better. I'm telling you that. It's decent. You learn about me. Then if I were to show you that story, I would say six days a week, I had to eat beanies and weenies. I had to find money in the crevices and the corners of my couch so that I can get my son milk. There were times when my heart would beat fast just at what am I going to have tomorrow? At some point, I got sick and tired of my own story. Is this going to be my future? No, I can't handle it. Notice the difference in that second story. Wow. I completely see that. I just painted a picture. Same story. Mm -hmm. Now, the second one, when you show a story, it's going to require more of you. It's going to require you to find the colors. What were you thinking? What were you experiencing? What was going on in your head? Instead of telling me you look for money, turn and point. Now, this is anywhere. This is anywhere you are doing anything. I promise you, you become a great storyteller and you will captivate your audience no matter what you're doing. I've captivated investors. I've captivated students. I've captivated educators because I was willing to show the story. I call it unpacking the story vision, being willing to tell me what were you thinking? What were you feeling? What were you seeing? Think about a story as an oral movie. And so in an oral movie, think when you're looking at a movie, the first thing they do is they identify what state of time it is. Is it futuristic? Is it in the now? Was it back in the day? You notice that based on what people are wearing, how they're talking. So paint that picture for me. Take me to that environment. Set the backdrop up for me. Show me what you're going through. Instead of saying I was angry, 
You can tell me you're angry. But when you say the hair on the back of my neck was standing up, I felt the fumes exiting my nose. I thought that my chest was going to pop and I was going to say something that I'd regret forever. Ooh, you just showed me you were angry. Take that extra time to unpack it. Why will most people not do that? Because it requires a level of vulnerability that we're not willing to share. But when you look at prioritizing, it really lives in, and I'm going to say this word, and you're probably not going to want to hear it, but when I tell you it's a game changer, when you master, and just for now, begin to operate inside of time management. I used to resist time management because I'm a, I'm a free spirit slash, people would call me a rebel back in the day, meaning I didn't want to be controlled. I wanted, I, I'm a butterfly, I wanted, to, I wanted to soar, I wanted to be free. Well, the reality is that when you manage your time more effectively, you actually create more freedom. That was a huge aha for me. Somebody's going to B-O-L right now, like breakthrough out loud. Because when you time manage, meaning, I'm going to use better blocks of my time. Let me give you some examples for that. I'm going to use better blocks of my time, meaning I'm only going to go in my email three times a day. I go on my email about 9.30, between 9.20 and 9.40, I go on my email. I stay in my email for 30 minutes. I'll go back in my email about three o'clock in the afternoon. I stay in my email again for about 30 minutes. I go back on my email one more time at 6 p.m. I stay in for about 30 minutes. That's it. I don't go in 19 times. I don't go in 20 times because three times a day gives me adequate time to see what's in there, see what's new, and act appropriately. Otherwise, it's throwing me off. I, I time block my day about 90 minutes each time block to do a task. Even if a task only takes me 30 minutes, I time block 90 minutes because I get distracted. But when you time block your, your day and then you schedule each day, not every day looks the same. I have a, a time block for everything I need to do for seven days out the week. Can you believe that in that time I got more things done? You have to become comfortable with your no. My grandmother says, baby, she starts every sentence with baby. Baby, if you want your yes to have more value, you need to learn how to exercise your no. See, your yes might not have its value anymore. Why? Because you give it away too much. You give it to too many people. You give it away too often. You're always over committing and then you feel drained and frustrated and you don't have gratitude in your heart because you're over committed. Well, that all started with a yes. That should have been a no, or should have been a, I'd love to, but not now. And so number two, number one is more effective time management that has your agenda in it, that has your prior priorities in it. Right now, your agenda is covered with everyone else's task. I, often, I heard once, if you don't have your agenda, then you're gonna work for somebody else's agenda. And so number one is your time management with your agenda, and number two, is operating, utilizing, and being comfortable in a no. And not an attitude no, not like a spank no, like no. Not that, mm -mm. just a no, not now. No, I, I, I would love to, but my plate is full. I'm free in 90 days. Just don't make, no, no energy, just not now. Don't be surprised when everyone comes to you. You're great, you're amazing, you're brilliant. Look at you, you're on this channel, so you know you're smart. You want a better life, you want a, an abundant life, of course you're here, of course everyone wants you. And your priorities matter. So the third thing is to remember, it's your job to fill your own tank. It's your job to fulfill your own dreams. It's your job to write the story that you're going to want to read. It's your job. So the responsibility of your dreams coming true does not belong to your husband, does not belong to your man, does not belong to your woman or to your children. So to, to wait and hope for them to one day see your dream as a priority, that's an unrealistic expectation. And actually, it's unfair. It's your priority. And what that looks like is carving out time. It looks like putting it on the agenda. It looks like declaring it out loud so that the world could hear. It looks like giving yourself a chance, a thousand chances, and pressing reset if you happen to fall down or sit down or get distracted. So if you wanna know what does it mean to keep your priorities, your dreams a priority, it starts with you. It starts right now. It starts right here. 
I, I know what it feels like to prioritize other people over my dream. I did it for years. I love being loved. I love love and I love being loved. And I used to say yes all the time just to be loved. And I realized that I was teaching the people around me how to treat me. That you teach the people around you how to treat you. So if they're treating you as if your life isn't a priority, your dreams aren't a priority, it's because you taught them how to treat you that way. I know, ouch, Lisa, dang. I know, it stings, it stings when I say it. It stings me when I say it. But the reality is, if you train them how to treat you, then you can retrain them how to treat you now. And so, and it's not a matter of making any big announcements. It starts with just setting some healthy boundaries. It's starting with making some time management. It starts by making sure you continue to come back here and that we stay connected and that you allow me or someone else to help navigate you through the terrain called designing a better life, the one that you love, the one that you're, you admire. And so let's start with those things because that'll make a huge difference in your life. In that year when I was really broken, I was really broken, I was working at LA Unified School District. <laughs> I was miserable. I was miserable because I wasn't living in my dream. I was just doing a J-O-B. And then one day, I said, well, what, what do I need to do? I, I, need, to, I need to buy my freedom. <laughs> That's what I need to do. I need to buy my freedom. Well, I don't know about buying my freedom. I don't know about buying. I don't know about having money saved up. My family didn't have money saved up. My mother used to tell me, oh, this money is burning my pocket. So I know two things about money. It's hot and we can't keep it long. We'd always have one week where we had all the food in the refrigerator and then one week where we were, the refrigerator was empty. Right, come on, come on, some of you guys know about that. To this day, I spend so much money on groceries, you guys, oh my God, it's like I'm feeding like a family of 10. Because I'm so afraid of anybody ever being in my house and being hungry. Right? And so I, I wrote a check to myself. Jelani was three. $110. I took it to the bank. Well, it's Fargo. I started a new account. The next check I wrote, $125. And just like the first check, I put in the memo line, funding my dream. I wasn't even clear what the dream was. But I knew there was something in my belly. Who, who in this room know you got something in your belly? There's something in your, I'm not even clear about it. I don't know how clear you are, but I wasn't clear about it. But I knew there was a calling on my life greater than working for LA Unified School District. And no disrespect to LA Unified School District, it just wasn't my destiny. I wrote another check in two weeks, $146, funding my dream. Now I started mailing the checks in because I didn't want to see my balance because I didn't want to go shopping. Because you're going to repeat what you learn, right? Until you decide to not repeat what you've learned. So I mailed the check in, and then I wrote another check. And I wrote another check. And every check I wrote, I made sure it was 5% more than the first check, the, the previous check. I sold my Altima. I had a car note. Sold my Altima, bought a clunker, because it didn't have a car note. Now I can write a bigger check, funding my dream. I moved out of my three-bedroom, three-bath three bath house and moved in, became a roommate with my friend who smoked. I put towels at the base of the door so the smoke wouldn't come through the door. I was willing to be inconvenienced, are you? Yes. yes. I'm just saying, I'm just, I'm just showing you the story I just, the charge I just gave you. I stopped get, getting my hair done. That was when I started going natural. <laughs> I, I stopped going out. I, I stopped going out dancing. I stopped going out to dinners. My family didn't know what was going on. They thought, oh my God, you know, it was LA. She's on drugs, but she's not losing weight, so maybe not. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I kept writing bigger checks to myself. $900, $900. I mailed it to Wells Fargo, funding my dream. $1,100, mailed it to Wells Fargo, funding my dream. I still wasn't clear what the dream was. I just knew I had one, and it was being born through me, and I needed to give it a chance. That's all I knew. You don't have to see 2,000 feet in front of you. Just see 200. 
and run to the 200. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. You'll have to see it all. Three and a half years later, I'd written a check to myself every two weeks for three and a half years. I didn't go out for three and a half years. I didn't go dancing. I get, didn't get my hair done. I didn't get my nails done for three and a half years. Are you willing to be inconvenienced for your conviction? I walk in to Wells Fargo three and a half years later and I said, hi, God bless you. Hi, my name is Lisa Nichols. She was, oh my God, you're the fun in my dream lady. I was like, yeah, I guess I am. And all of a sudden, all the tellers came running around. The manager came, they're like, oh my God, okay, oh my God, we have been wondering. We all got the same question. Y'all know what the question is, right? <laughs> What's your dream? I was like, um, I'm not sure, but I know that it includes inspiring people, having people believe in themselves again teaching them how to get back up when they've been knocked down, get, having them be willing to give themselves a thousand second chances. And every time they get to 999, press reset. I'm not sure what it's gonna look like, but it's just gonna help people. I said, I came to check my balance. I've been writing a few checks to you guys. I said, yes, you've been writing a lot. I said, I just want to check my balance. He said, you don't know your balance? I said, no, I got this really big stack of summary bank statements at home because my mama said money burns her pocket and I don't want it to burn my pocket. I want it to pay for my freedom. I said, I just came to see what my balance was if I had enough to fund my dream as it gets clear. She wrote it down, everyone's excited. She wrote it down, turned it around to me. I looked at it, I said, Oh no, my name is Lisa Shantae Nichols, and my social security number, I said, that is not my money. And I am not taking that money because you're probably going to want it back. So just fix that error right now. And they looked at me. They said, you really don't think that's yours? I said, no, my family's never had $5,000 in the bank or $10,000 in the bank. $62,500 in the bank. They said, Miss Nichols, and everyone teared up. The manager teared up, the tellers teared up. They said, Miss Nichols, whatever your dream is, I think you can fund it now. I looked at my son, Jelani, who now is five or six, and I said, Jelani, our lives are gonna be a little different now, baby. Jelani said, yeah, mommy, can we, can we now go to McDonald's? <laughs> See, for three years I've been telling Jelani, I'll make you a Big Mac. <laughs> Mama makes Big Macs better than McDonald's. And so it began with a $110 check. So I don't know what yours is. I don't know what your radical looks like. For some of you, your radical was coming here, right? Yes, yes? Yes, yes? And this is the beginning. Yes, yes. This is the beginning of your radical. This is, the, this is the, be, the next best step. This is the first step. And so I just stopped by to let you know you're on the right path. And, and as you ramp up, as you ramp up, you're going to have questions. You're going to be afraid. I do more things afraid now than I do fearless. Because the bigger you play, the bigger your breakdowns. Every single one of my errors in the last five years have cost me six figures. Like every single one. Every single one of my errors has required me to call an attorney. <laughs> like they're just big, because I'm playing big. I'm playing big, so be willing to go to the edge. And this is where you are here. Be willing to go to the edge and not just lean over and feel the breeze and watch the people jump and watch them soar and look through the windows at all the people who are living great lives. Don't just go to the edge and feel it. Be willing to lean. Feel your heartbeat. Feel it. That lets you know you're alive. That lets you know you're okay. 
Fear fuels you. Fear lets you know, go get more information. Fear lets you know, stay up a little later and study. Fear lets you know, get up a little earlier. Fear lets you know, ask for help. Fear is informing you. It's not stopping you. It's just another emotion like love and compassion and gratitude. We just made it paralyze us. See, fear doesn't stop me. Fear informs me. And when you get intimately connected with the fear, I feel it, and I'm moving forward anyway. I feel it, and I'm gonna love anyway. I feel it, and I'm gonna invest in me anyway. I feel it, and I'm gonna show up and play anyway. When you get connected with fear, it becomes your best friend, and when you stand on the edge, you feel the breeze. You feel the fear, and you leap Anyway, you know, so many times people um, look at the habits that they have, such as procrastination, and ask, why do I procrastinate? Well, I pose that question back to you. Ask yourself, what's the benefit? Because there's a benefit that you're getting out of it. So whether you believe that last minute throws you inside of an energy source, because that's what I used to think. I used to think, oh, last minute, I'm more creative. Well, the truth is you're not more creative last minute. The truth is that when you wait to the last minute, you're increasing your stress level. Um, you're bringing down your joy. You're eliminating peace of mind. When you understand the cost, um, procrastination is a word. And, and, and the challenge is that procrastination is so universally accepted. It's like fear and stress. Like I'm so stressed out. And it's become such our norm that it's okay. Well, ask yourself the question, what's the price that I pay? Because I believe any behavior that you don't want any longer, the way that the catalyst to change is recognizing the price. Because we're high producers, we can still get it done inside of procrastinating. We can still get it done. But if you ever take a moment to stop and ask yourself and answer, what's the cost of me procrastinating. And you can do that for everything, uh, but we're focused on procrastination now. What's the cost of me pro procrastinating? Let's go down that list. When you procrastinate, it costs you clear organizational time because now you're rushing. When you procrastinate, it costs you peace of mind. When you procrastinate, you're now thrown in urgency Urgency increases your stress. Urgency is known to increase your stress. If you live in urgency, you literally are, are two, three times more likely to have a heart attack, I hear. Not confirmed, but that's what I heard. So if you live in this pace of urgency all the time because of a behavior that you can modify, think about it. How are we forward moving, upperly mobile? How are we brilliant and operating in something we can control? There's so many things that you can't control. Procrastination is something that you can control. I used to be last minute and I resisted. I gotta tell you, I resisted planning. I thought that it was for slackers, I didn't need to plan, I can, I can go off the fly and I'm pretty creative. And I can get myself out of some pretty hairy situations and I can produce pretty good content, pretty good experiences last minute. So I lived in the last minute conversation. I didn't even call it procrastination, it was just when it was scheduled to be done. So if I'm flying out at noon, I can pack at seven in the morning. When I realized that I eliminated the space that I needed to do it in such a planned, methodical way that on the other side, I felt good about it. When you wait to the last minute to do anything, you've now taken the joy away that comes with having the space to do it in a timeline that's effective. But here's the other thing. I ask you, what are you proving to yourself when you can get it done at the last minute? What are you proving to yourself? Because there's some form of proving or denying or there's something going on that you still need to do, especially if you know how to plan in other areas of your life. You can't be a part-time planner, part-time strategist, part-time person who's prepared, and then in this other area you're not. No, now you're making a choice. So why do you choose to procrastinate? What do you believe it's giving you? And if you found out that it's not really giving you what you thought it's giving you, or if you found out that procrastination is giving you a whole lot more than you bargained for, it's giving you stress. It's giving you the, the non-gift of urgency. It's giving you all these things that you go, oh, I didn't know all that comes with it. Yeah, and the challenge is you manage all that well. And because you manage it well, you think it's okay to have it. Can we give you more peace of mind? I packed the same exact clothes for a trip. 
I simply pack for the trip 72 hours in advance. So the final 72 hours that I have, I can use that relaxing or I can use that planning something else. But when I'm in urgency packing, and I've been there plenty of times, I lose the creativity, I lose the peace of mind, and I lose a little bit of joy because now I'm bumped up against a deadline that's so intense and it's a non-negotiable deadline. If I back away from that deadline and I give space and grace and ease, it actually is a form of self-love. I know that sounds crazy, that planning and not procrastinating is a form of self-love. But see, when you procrastinate, you're putting that thing you need to do last, which really is putting you last again. So if you procrastinate, you're putting yourself last. It's not the only time you put yourself last. It's a behavior and a habit that you do. So I ask, can you move yourself up to the top? You might not put yourself first, but can you put yourself second? I'm gonna shoot for first. Procrastination, overcoming procrastination. I'm, you're talking to a, recover, a recovering procrastinator. That when I moved from procrastination to better planning, I felt the grace and ease and space in my life. I still had the same hours in the day. I just organized them differently. I just set better priorities, more effective priorities. That you're not supposed to enjoy, you're not supposed to enjoy the experience when you get there. You're supposed to enjoy the experience and the journey getting there. And when you move from procrastination to planning, to time management, and time management is a fact. Time management is a direct, has a direct impact on procrastination. If it matters to you, it should find its way in your calendar. It should find its way. When I'm going on a trip, I have pack. I have pack in my calendar. I have it pack in my calendar four days before I'm leaving so that if I run out of time and it takes me a whole day to get to packing, I'm still three days early. It took a long time to learn that. Procrastination is showing up for you last. Are you willing to show up for you first? Are you willing to trust if you can do a good job at the last minute? What can you do if you planned it out in a more effective way? What can you do if you just live this next season on what could I do if I search for the best and brightest version of myself? Procrastination will be on the list of one of the things you modify to discover the best and brightest and most brilliant version of yourself. Christy talked about affirmations. Abundant thinkers understand the power of I am. Anything after the word I am is true to your unconscious mind, Michael. Anything. Anything after I am. Anything. Anything after I am. Even if you just, you know it's not true, your conscious mind will believe it. Anything after I am. So the use of affirmations is very intentional and very consistent. I was diagnosed as clinically depressed and too... 1,001, 94, 95, 96, 97, 1998, I'm sorry. I was diagnosed as clinically depressed. Me, it didn't make sense. I had been in a relationship, I was engaged to get married, and my fiancé, um, who I did not know at the time, uh, was bipolar. And he'd stopped taking his medicines and under the belief system that love can cure anything. And so um, I ended up being picked up and thrown three feet across the room, and I ended up being choked until I passed out. And once I got out of that relationship, um, I just was different. It was different. So my mom insisted that I go to the doctor. I went to the doctor, and I sat on the table, and she checked me and talked to me and came back in with a prescription. And she said, Lisa, you're clinically depressed. And I felt like I heard Charlie Brown's parents talking, like, wah, wah. Wah, wah, wah. Clinically depressed, at least that don't, that don't make sense in that same sentence. And she get, handed me a prescription, and I read the prescription, and it had my name on it, and it said Prozac. And I thought, that don't, that don't make sense. Lisa Nichols, Pro, that don't make sense. And I said, do you mean I'm sad? She said, very, very sad. I said, can I try something? And I'm not, I'm not uh, recommending you guys, if, if you're on medication, you stop taking your meds. Please don't do that. I asked my doctor. She agreed. I said, do you mind if I try something before I take this? She goes, yes, but I need to see you back in 30 days. If you're in the same condition, I need us to try this medicine. I said, okay, I can do that. So I went home, and every day I got in the mirror, and I drilled I am every day because I realized I had forgotten who I was. Yes, yes. I, I just forgot. I just, and it was okay to forget. I just forgot. So every day 
Every day for 25 minutes, I just went over the I ams. Every day, I am, I am, I am. And then I, I, I parallel that with I forgive you for. Then I parallel that with I commit to you, Lisa. Every single day. I went back in 30 days, and I'm talking to her, and I'm on fire. She's just looking at me. And I'm just talking, talking. She twisted her head again. And I'm just talking, talking. She says, wait, I got to stop you. I said, what? She goes, what are you taking? And can I have some? <laughs> I was like, I'm taking some of me. And so the power of I am, the power of I am can pull you through the darkest moment, the power of I am. If you want another awesome video in our Black Excellence series, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there.